Good afternoon. Uh, good evening. This is uh, your host, Tony Rogers, for this segment of the H2W uh, week-long virtual conference. Uh, we uh, are going to talk about uh, uh, something that is extremely important as it relates to the New York State's um, uh, cannabis uh, legislation that uh, will pass soon. One of the things that uh, has been important is that if you were able to watch uh, our video and you can watch it uh, at uh, at any time on h2w.nyc once it's posted, that took place yesterday about the many different uses of camp hemp and how it will become a major entity uh in uh the future and also there was uh, a lot of information about cannabis and, and and the things that it's going to do it's called the green rush but um one of the things that needs to really be discussed is well what does that mean to the communities that have uh suffered uh the most uh based on the prohibition uh there is a term a movement throughout the state uh, and the slogan is restorative justice. And when you talk about uh, r restorative, uh, you're talking about based on uh, the definition, uh, which I actually wrote down and was interesting, restore health, strengthen, and well-being. So that's what we're talking about as far as uh, the communities of color in New York State. So this discussion will be a way to educate you, a call to action, and to understand some of the things that would be necessary in order for us to um, have restorative justice. So I would f first like to bring up, and I have a panel of friends from for some time, and you know, this is great to be able to come together, even as virtually. The My first uh, panelist, is Maria Granville, who is a neighbor. And uh, at some point, we'll have to talk about her wonderful uh, house. And, and we have to talk and let you know about that. Because once we, once this is over, we have a, we have a rain check for a Harlem Tourism Board. I'm the president of the Harlem Tourism Board. And we were supposed to have our membership meeting. Richard is coming. He's the vice president of the program. So, so we had to keep that rain check to make sure you guys know what it is. But she has a wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, location right around the corner for me, which is really convenient. <laughs> but, <laughs> Thank you, but Maria has, Maria was one of the first persons uh, to talk about websites and how they could be marketed. This was way before, you know, uh, uh, people start to understand the necessity of it, you know, and um, she's been uh, involved in that type of uh, medium for a long time. I had a business there. She's an entrepreneur. She has a, a, a wonderful art gallery, but she's also an advocate. And she put together, along with Regina Smith, who will be coming on, uh, a presentation, and we're going to do some of it, but it's talking about the things that we should be, we are uh, people of color at any rate, who have been harmed the most, what we should be focused on as it relates to this legislation. And that's what this panel will focus on, um, uh, restorative justice. So Maria, please uh, give, uh, uh, and it's not, there's such a we have to make sure that we do something where they can see everything and we let them know where they can go and see all of the different points but give uh the listeners some of and viewers i should say some i'm used to my radio show some of the things that uh you talked about uh in our in the 420 conference about restorative justice well, thank you, Tony. Thank you for having me. I hope everyone can hear me well. well. I'm going to keep this one um, short and to the point. Mm -hmm. And um, what we want to, to do is we are hoping that the audience will join us and speak in one voice. 
And in order to speak in one voice, we have to speak the same language and we have to understand what certain terms mean versus what they mean in our head. So I'm going to start with terminology mattering, okay? And the first thing that I want to start with is, you know, the term minorities. This list is um, what the term minority means. All of those groups are in this list. It doesn't mean black. It doesn't mean, you know, people of color doesn't mean black. MWBE does not mean black. Affirmative action does not mean black. None of these things mean black. So when we look at restorative justice and um, marijuana legalization, the current legalization um, legislation has minorities and women-owned businesses and disabled vets and disadvantaged farmers, all of these groups eligible for what we are calling restorative justice um, pr programs. And this is, these are the groups, this is a, a graph of the people who have been arrested for marijuana possession. So why exactly are all of those other groups that have not um, been impacting, impacted going to benefit? Um, so what we'd like to do is have everyone use the term most harmed. And the most harmed includes every race, gender, you know, sexual orientation, but it's clearly defined as people who were arrested or and convicted and or incarcerated or their communities or their family that were over policed. And we want to say restorative justice and not social equity, because when you say social equity, it's like they're writing this legislation to cure all of the <coughs> ills of all of the individuals. It's not. It's for the people that were most harmed. And then when we move over to the economic realities, we're talking about Black people, okay? And Black people's economic realities are getting much worse. But when, for instance, you look at minorities in the MWBE programs in New York City, okay? This is a graph from 2017. New York City spent $16 billion on MWBEs alone. Black entrepreneurs got point, point one percent So that little green line that you see here, that's how much black people got out of all of the spend. The top bar, those are white women. The middle bar are Asians and the blue are Hispanic. So again, where economic realities are concerned, when you dilute the pot, black people always come out on the bottom. We have to have restorative justice legislation written for the individuals that were most harmed. And if we go back to this graph, we see 51.3% of black people were the ones who were arrested in 2018. So um, the legislation itself, we feel it should be written specifically for people most harmed by the war on drugs. I said this before, not to cure all social ills, not for women, not for disabled vets, only for those people who are most harmed, which women and disabled vets are part of the, the, the um, cohort. And it should include business development, workforce development, community development, and criminal justice reform. There were two versions of um, the legislation out there. One was written by um, Liz Kruger and, Chris, and Assembly Chair um, Crystal People Stokes of Buffalo. That's called MRTA. And then there's CERTA that was produced by the governor. And this is just a little table showing some of the differences. Big one here, okay? Stop criminalization of legacy market possession. 
In Myrta, they want to give you a fine if you have two pounds of weed on you. Illicit, not purchased from a dispensary. The governor wants it to be an arrestable misdemeanor. So he still wants to arrest people even after we legalize um, as part of the legalization movement. So we are supporting Myrta with changes and we just think that CERTA is so far away from what really needs to be um, passed that uh, you might as well just start with MRTA and negotiate from there. Um, so we're saying say no to CERTA, change MRTA. And in order to change MRTA, we would like them to remove the language concerning minorities and disabled vets and just use most harmed. We would like to be the first and only to market not the current medical marijuana um, um, companies. They won funding, vertical integration, exclusivity in our communities. We would actually like to be able to open a dispensary anywhere in the state, but we would like our most harmed communities, of which there are about 14 that are easily identifiable throughout the state, um, that we're the only ones, restorative justice um, um, licensees, are the only ones who can open in those areas. Um, the, the, the legislation has an income restriction in it, which I'm, I'm really not sure why, but it's important to understand what it means. It says that uh, you have to make 80% um, of... Um, one of those indices. And for New York State, that's $60,000. So 80% of that is like $48,000. If you're talking about it starting a $3 million company, um, I'm, I'm a little confused as to why, you know, I mean, you know, sanitation workers make twice that. <laughs> Are you saying that they wouldn't be eligible for the programs that, that this is involved in? So I think that they need to look at that. Um, and other than that, next steps, um, we'll discuss it, uh, adopt our language, um, educate yourselves, understand that every time we fight for minorities or we fight for MWBEs, we are fighting to keep ourselves at the bottom of the barrel. Thank you. Hello? Are you guys still there? Can you hear me? Hello? Can you hear me? I see, you couldn't hear me um, for some reason. Uh, I can hear you guys and uh, what I was saying, uh, nobody could hear. I uh, thank you, uh, uh, Maria, for um, that presentation, even though it was shorter than what we have, but you were to the point as it relates to what we need to talk about. The next thing was saying, and no one heard obviously, um, is a person who has been 
at in, on the ground fighting uh, for small businesses for many years. Um, she uh, takes the lead of her mom, who was an advocate, uh, chairperson of Community Board 10 for Central Harlem for many years. And and uh, Regina has um, really uh, picked up where, uh, you know, as that family advocacy spirit and uh, has been working for small businesses for uh, a period of time as head of the Eight Harlem Business Alliance. Matter of fact, it was at the Harlem Business Alliance when I first really became aware of the issue of uh, restorative uh, justice. I was focused more on the medical issues of and, and, and wellness issues of, of, of cannabis, but Regina, uh, made me understand that there were some other things that needed to be focused on before legalization would take place in New York. So, uh, Regina, can you come on and just give us a little bit of information about Harlem Business Alliance, some of the things I know your major focus for for has been working to get some money, especially in some of the small businesses in, in, in Central Harlem. And, and Regina, I hope you don't mind me saying it, but Regina... Uh, was ill, and the way I found out that Regina was ill is that my cousin would say, "Where's Regina? She's working with me to get money." My cousin, who was the publisher of the Hollow Community News, she said, "We gotta, we gotta find out where she is." <laughs> you know, I haven't heard from her. I said, "Well, you know, I was calling around. I said I might have to go find out where the sister is because these days, when you don't know, hear from somebody, you know, for a while, you got to go check and see where they are." But I'm glad to say that her immune system was strong, even though she hasn't come to the center as I would like her to do. But her immune <laughs> system is strong and she's healthy and you can see that uh, she's there. But Re Regina, give us a little information as to when you started understanding that this legislation had to be uh, focused on. Well, seven year, uh, several years ago, Cassandra from the uh, Drug Policy Alliance approached my daughter. Okay, so we're talking about a generational three, uh, three generations. That's your mom, you, and your daughter. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Reached out to her and said that she thought that it would be good if the Drug Policy Alliance and the Harlem Business Alliance put together a forum for uh, black businesses because at some point in time, uh, cannabis would be legalized and there would be business opportunities, and we needed to inform our community about the opportunities and get them ready. And so um, I spoke to my board and my board uh, was like, uh, no. So uh, <laughs> they circled back uh, uh, my team at HBA, uh, you know, they broached it again. I went back to my board and uh, they said that it was all right. And from that point on, uh, we uh, endeavored to uh, do just that. So we had a forum at the B National Black Action Network. No, I'm sorry, at the National Black Theater and um, actually had speakers who had been in this space for quite some time, for years. And uh, they were um, they were eager to come and participate in the forum uh, for um, for many reasons, but the main one was to be in an environment where they were with black people who understood the business opportunities and wanted to be uh, positioned to take advantage of them. Because what they were getting primarily was a uh, pushback from the black community. You know, from our churches, uh, state that cannabis should be legalized, <coughs> excuse me, uh, should be legalized uh, and uh, weren't um, looking at or realizing that it is going to be legalized. It has been legalized in a number of states around the country. And the people who are benefiting primarily from the legalization are white people. Uh, and while uh, thousands of black men are still incarcerated for uh, selling you know, uh, minor amounts, and so uh, it, it just absolutely became imperative that that you know we we inf um, in inform our community, educate them, uh, let them know that this was something that was coming down the pike, and to start uh, getting prepared. 
So um, we had we had that form. It was well attended uh, and uh, well received. And after that, we had meetups on a regular basis to talk about different aspects of uh, of the business. Uh, you know, you have the dispensaries, you have uh, uh, various uh, products, uh, medicinal and non medicinal, uh, where people can. You have edibles. Uh, we taught the benefits. You know how it can affect your health. Uh, how it might be a good thing for our seniors to uh, to uh, uh, embrace uh, some of the products because it can you know it can help you uh, in so many different ways. So uh, we've done that, but also uh, we realized that it was important for us to uh, develop our own platform because uh, the Black community has never been in, uh, has never been um, um, considered for economic empowerment initiatives in New York State. I don't care whether or not the administration has been a Democratic administration or a Republican, but um, we saw that uh, the doors were going to be swung wide open for uh, the medical uh, the medical uh, cannabis companies that came in. Uh, 10 of them were licensed and not one of them were black. Uh, the hurdles, the challenges in order to get into, uh, to open up a medical dispensary was incredibly high. You had to spend millions of dollars. So uh, we were looking at the legislation across various uh, states to see, you know, which ones were doing what needed to be done in terms of uh, social equity and economic equity for black people. Black people have been the most harmed pe uh, uh, individuals in New York City and New York State. Uh, most of our men uh, were in prison and we're talking about 50, going back 50 years or so ago. I remember it as, as a young child. So while all of this was going on, our uh, men, their black bodies were fueling uh, upstate uh, economies with their uh, prisons and uh, wreak wreaking havoc on our communities. So to me, it's only fair and it's only just that uh, black people have an opportunity to uh, to make money. Uh, when marijuana is uh, legalized and that we should be the primary beneficiaries of any uh, benefits uh, that are designed uh, by the state. So we have been pushing, we saw what the weaknesses were in other states. Uh, some of them are still working on uh, tightening up their programs. Uh, and so uh, we are uh, working hard in encouraging our elected officials to make certain that uh, this legislation, uh, when it is passed, that it meets the needs of, uh, of the most harmed individuals, which have been black people across this state. We have been the most harmed, the highest percentage of individuals incarcerated are black men. So we need to benefit the most. And so um, we're calling for a number of things that uh, Maria shared with you in our presentation in terms of uh, uh, um, effectuating meaningful restorative justice uh, that not only has um, uh, social benefits to it, but benefits our community economically. Because as you know, uh, we are doing horribly uh, in New York City, although we represent 22% of the population, we only have 2% of the businesses. And that was before this pandemic. And uh, if things continue the way they are now, we won't have hardly any black owned businesses, which is a travesty. And so uh, it's imperative on many levels. The stronger the community is economically, the stronger we will have we will be when it comes to you know uh, good health practices and uh, the educational uh, the education that our children are taught, uh, the the way we are policed. You know, I mean, it just affects everything. So that's why it's important that we realize how how, how critical it is to be um, economically empowered. Uh, so that we can um, not only create wealth, generate wealth, we can pass it on to our children. So um, those were the reasons, those are the reasons that, you know, we feel passionate about what we're doing and, uh, and stepping to the table and pushing incredibly hard to make certain that we are not overlooked again. Well, thank you, Regina. Uh, again, it's such an important uh, concept and um, uh, 
uh, one that we all as a people, I mean, black, brown, you know, I mean, people, period, because we're only as strong as our weakest link. And some of the issues that may be overlooked because it's not about us, it's about them, tend to come full circle, whether it's drugs or anything uh, uh, that has happened over the years. But uh, this is uh, a very important issue. Uh, matter of fact, my next guest is Richard Cox, who uh, created uh, a program uh, called 420. For many who might not know, April the um, uh, 20th is the, the celebration of cannabis and the many things that they can do. It has become a political uh, point for advocacy around the world actually as it relates to uh cannabis but one of the things that uh and richard just had a, a very successful um uh conference a virtual conference on 420 and uh, uh there was a lot of great information that that took place but again that concept about how much of an economy that uh, hip and, and cannabis will be in the future. Matter of fact, uh, many have said that this may be the last opportunity for people of color to really be able to develop that economic base, just as the when the prohibition of alcohol, that brought together many millionaires, people who were in the game illegally, but then when they flipped became able to use everything that they had, whether it was the Kennedys or it, all of those who were involved to flip it and, and become wealthy. Uh, this is the thing that uh, I learned, you know, in hanging with Rich and the different conferences that he was dealing with. And one of the things, and Mm -hmm. oh, I can put it on mute. But uh, if you go into any black community, you see everybody except for black. And I'm not trying to do anything other than saying what the fact is. So one of the things that I learned in talking with Richard and being on this conference was this whole thing about uh, a community and, and certain restrictions as well as businesses develop. But Richard, uh, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having a great vision of doing the educational component of, of, of what cannabis means and uh, so many other things. And each one of you have a lot of other stuff that we'll talk about, hopefully, before this is over, because there's so many other things that Richard is doing. But this was one that was very educational. Thank you, Richard. How are you doing? Well, thank you, Tony. Um, and the great success, I always say, happy 420. It's, uh, <laughs> it's always 420 for me every day. And also uh, the, the great success that we had this past uh, Monday was only because of persons like yourself, uh, Maria and Regina and their contribution uh, to giving us a great 420 celebration. So we have to thank you for that. You know, one of the things about Code 420 events, uh, what we tell everyone is basically that, you know, Code 420 events is a leader in cannabis education and advocacy. Uh, whereas our mission is to educate the community about the inevitable. And, you know, what is the inevitable? Well, the inevitable really is that the modern day cannabis movement is not going anywhere. Therefore, we must take our approach and educate the response. And we say that a response is more like if we put a form together where you may have a child that's coming of age and that child is about to indulge in alcohol, for example. You want to instruct that child to drink responsibly. So at Code 40, 420 event forums, we tell our followers you have to engage responsibly. Because like we just said, you know, this modern day cannabis movement is not really going anywhere. 
So who do we consider our followers? We consider people, our followers and people who we want to hear our message, uh, people like the politicians, uh, the medical community, uh, the enthusiasts, um, the business person, you know, the, regardless of where they are in the supply chain. We want these folks to be part of our forums and to help others gain the knowledge that they need to be part of this movement. You know, because one of the things about Code 420 is that we try to start with the basic education. Uh, some of the folks who we are marketing to and how we put our events towards, uh, they don't even really understand some of the common terms of this movement. And they're still referring to terms that are, you know, past sense. One of the first terms I always laugh about when, you know, we started this movement with Code 420 events is that usual term we call uh, tetrahydrocannabinoids. <laughs> and, you know, you might want to say that five times fast, but that's just really the extended version of the term THC. So, you know, it's, 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 it's terms like that that we need to educate ourselves with. So this way, as we become more involved in the industry and we start looking at other opportunities with industry, regardless where you're on a supply chain, you know, that education is going to be, this, it's going to be a necessity, you know, especially we start getting more into the business developments and so forth, where people will be actually uh, being involved in educating and marketing at a certain level. Um, we have two other movements that are coming up pretty soon. Um, one of them, and I think, you know, Regina, you know, touched about it a little bit, is that next year, not only are we going to have a code 420, we're going to have a code 421. The code 421 movement basically talks about people who were unjust, unjustly incarcerated because of this movement. And we talked about the percentages, you know, of people in our community that are incarcerated because of what we call an offense. We're going to have a not only a code 420, but a code 421 next year to address some of these injustices. So, you know, we're very happy once again, Tony, to be part of this discussion. Um, and it's just more of an exciting, uh, it gets more exciting by the day as we more get more indulged, how we get excited about educating our communities uh, with, through our forums. Uh, we've had successful forums. Um, you know, we were thankful that this one on the 20th uh, not only had hundreds of people um, popping in and out through Zoom, but the thousands of people who watched the rebroadcast. And once again, we have to thank people like yourself and Maria and Regina for being part of that great celebration. Well, thank you, Richard. I, you know, it's it's been uh, an interesting time. I think we started doing this almost three years ago with the 420 uh, uh, awareness uh, events. But again, one of the things and that I also got from uh, one of the, the the uh, conferences or a workshop that was at the HBA was the whole idea, which makes a lot of sense, that um, there should be certain types of restrictions in communities such as the Harlem or communities in the South Bronx, communities in Brooklyn that suffered the most so that when businesses are starting to develop, and there will be a number of businesses that uh, it, it, a business should not be able to come into a community on its own. And, and I believe I'm saying this right. For about three years, if a, if a business is set up, it has to have some relationship with a community-based entrepreneur or it should be a community-based business so that we don't find ourselves being put into a position like it is now, that most of the businesses that or in our community, or not us, you know? And in this case, uh, since this is a new kind of uh, goal rush, and we know that that's going to start to come, we have to find a way to protect that. So, Regina, did I have that right, or could you talk a little bit about that as far as where communities and where businesses should be developing as part of the plan? Oh, yes, we definitely believe that uh, our businesses black owned businesses, people who have been most harmed should be the ones who have uh, exclusive uh, exclusive rights to open up these businesses within our community. 
as well as outside of our communities. So, uh, and, and I agree, you know, 100% that uh, other uh, entities should not be able to come into our community, uh, establish themselves because they are um, well capitalized and then wind up monopolizing the market. So that's uh, totally unacceptable and we cannot allow that to happen. So yes, that, that's exactly what we're pushing for. Well, my question, and this is for everyone, if some of the legislation, and we have to understand what the acronyms of those two are, but mm. it, it was indicated, uh, Maria, when you gave your presentation uh, on the 4th, uh, I mean on the 20th, that mm -hmm. And you mentioned it again. There was a forty thousand dollars was a, a, a number that didn't make sense. Plus, um, even if that did make sense, there are a lot of people who are not going to have the money and the education in order to start a business. So, how do we um, demand certain things, understanding some of the shortcomings that those communities based on the fact that the demand will have. Tony, if can, you can hear me, yeah. if we are able to get the legislation written um, so it benefits those most harmed. And remember, we said that that should be the goal. That should be how they are writing it. If we can get that legislation written in that way, then the investment dollars will come. One of the things that we are saying is, in addition to exclusivity, which you mentioned, we're also saying that we should be first and only for at least three years, the only ones to get licenses. Um, the city of Cambridge in Massachusetts tried that. The medical marijuana companies fought it in court and won. So right now, Cambridge is not issuing any licenses. That's the same thing that New York can do until we do the business development piece to get our businesses ready. Now, companies, businesses, nonprofits like HBA, HBA has the um, resources, the talent to help businesses start. And when I say talent, I mean talent. Everybody from marketing, legal, accounting, technology, supply chain, we have the talent to help, especially legacy operators, start a legal business. Now these guys have a business. Legacy operators are hu a huge problem for the state. They're a problem for every legal state, legacy, black market, whatever you want to call it, illicit. <laughs> the guys who are currently selling now, who will be selling after legalization. Well, just like just like the, the Kennedys were saying, who were well, selling through a prohibition. And California is feeling it, for instance, because their tax revenue has taken a huge, is not what they expected it to be. The reason CERTA, that's Government Cuomo's legislation, wants to arrest people for having illicit is because they want to kill the black market. But the black market is, New York's black market is the most sophisticated in the world. <laughs> if they really want to get the tax revenue, they need organizations like HBA, okay, to help these guys start their companies, be their CEOs, be their CFOs, while we are showing them what a CEO and a CFO is and taxes need to be filed, et cetera, et cetera, and then let them run with it. That way you have people who have already been doing this for years who have jobs and let them continue to have their job versus like prohibition or numbers as soon as it became legal, people who had jobs no longer have income. That's true. Our legacy market needs to be transitioned. The legislation needs to be written 
so it benefits our legacy market. I can guarantee you if the legislation is written correctly, so there can be no court challenges, they will line up to be 49% partners in every business that opens. Which is again, something that, and we'll get to that as far as how people can begin to, to, to do this, starting, I guess, with your, your local uh, politics and going all the way, all the way up. And Richard, that may be some wisdom. And Regina, I know that uh, you have this on your plate is to provide the type of lobbying and the type of uh, expertise that's necessary. Because when we talk about legislation, we're talking about politicians. And the only way that you're going to get a politician to listen to you in most cases is the numbers of people who can vote. And, uh, and we have to kind of make sure uh, that those people in our communities that represent us have to know that if you're not going to do what you need to do, <laughs> you, 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 we're not going to vote for you. And it's, and, it's, and, it's, and it's not that difficult of an of, of a, of a ask, because as you were saying, you know, this is our, we can't lose this one, because what's going to happen um, Chef uh, Keedy uh, Abdu uh, made it clear. Uh, hemp may save the world. I mean, there's so much stuff that, you know, based on the Section 1 legislation and all of that, there's so much stuff that we don't know. What we do know is amazing. What we don't know is, is, is we don't know what we don't know. But so we need to, this is very important. The most important thing that I, in my lifetime, am seeing, I mean, we talked about civil rights, but, you know, but we still don't have the jobs. You know, you know we talk about college to get a job. You know, we, you know, we, we, we never really uh, had the ability to, to really have that education as it relates to to create a job, to create your 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 your, your legacy instead of working for someone else, this is that opportunity, it, and that's why the education is so. That's why what you're doing is so important. But this is that opportunity, and and I believe, you know, I believe, you know, that it's our time. We just have to act on it. I mean, you can't when you go back and look at, you know. Uh, ancient Kemet, and you can see the 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 hemp leaf on the crown of of the goddess of knowledge. You know, this is not this is our time, and the thing that uh, is important is that it's also our time to overcome a lot of the stuff. This may be why we were brought here. You know, I believe that people of color, you know, were like sleeping giants. You know, and there needed to be something to wake them up. And once they woke, you know, that that will be it. But uh, I, I think this may be that that thing. You know, um, given a divine intervention. How can uh, Regina? We'll start with you. How can people who are listening, listening at this? How can they get involved in the restorative justice movement? Well. The first thing that they can do is they can become informed, but they definitely need to talk to their elected officials uh, and let them know that we demand restorative justice. And what that means is that uh, uh, these opportunities for uh, uh, black businesses, black men to uh, benefit from this legislation and black women to benefit from this le legislation is, is critical. It needs to happen. And uh, we need to be able to uh, be the first to market. We need to have the exclusivity that Maria spoke to. Uh, and we need to uh, develop our entrepreneurs so that they get not uh, 49%, but actually uh, majority ownership in any businesses that are created. Uh, and we need to have uh, a, a lot of them created in all of these communities, these black communities that were tremendously harmed uh, to to be able to benefit from this uh, this this industry. Because as we well know, I mean, 
yes, during prohibition, we made money. Uh, during the numbers, we made a lot of money. So those economic opportunities were snatched from us and weren't replaced with anything. So then, as you said, we were supposed to seek out jobs, go to college and seek out jobs. But we know full well that most of the corporations out here don't hire too many black people. You look at white businesses, it's a struggle. You look at Asian businesses, they don't hire any black people at all. You look at Latino businesses, uh, dark skinned Latinos, have a problem getting hired in their companies. So it's incumbent upon, upon black people to understand that and to stop talking in terms of people of color, minorities and all the rest of that and focus. Be laser focused on creating black owned businesses because we in fact hire each other. So we'll hire each other we uh, need to create these businesses. We need to support these businesses in order for us to thrive and grow as a community because right now we are dying as a community. We're going to continue to be gentrified out of this community and our people are going to continue to die from pandemics such as this one. And our businesses are going to be shut down while uh, people talk about what needs to be done for minorities and people of color and everybody else instead of focusing on us when we're the ones that are drowning. So uh, um, I urge them to have those conversations and discussions with their elected officials. Uh, and yes, they do need to understand that if they don't represent us, if they don't bring uh, the type of legislation and resources to our community, that we will replace them. We cannot afford to have any more uh, 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 elected officials in office who do not deliver directly to our community. It has got to stop. And how, Regina, how can people reach you? How can people reach the Harlem Business Alliance? What well, they can, um, they can reach out to me by uh, emailing me at rsmith at hbany.org, and that stands for Harlem Business Alliance New York. So again, it's rsmith at hbany.org. Is there a website, um, Regina, that people can, can go to? Uh, www.hbany.org. And, 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 one of the things that I think that's important is that we have to have uh, things like the presentation that you did, Maria. We need to have that online uh, based on what's happening now with the pandemic. We have to have the information so that when people are talking to their elected officials, we're talking it with the same voice. So there's a language that needs to be had. And one of the things that, um, is very important and, and, and it has been something that uh, has bothered me for some time is that black people sometimes have a problem of demanding things that everybody else has. I mean, I mean, uh, and that's everybody, uh, whether it's Italians don't have any problem telling you this is an Italian neighborhood and if you're not Italian, you can have a problem doing this unless you you know, hire some of us. At any community, any community, whether Hispanic, and again, with Hispanic, as you mentioned, if you're darker, you're going to have more problems than if you're, if you're not. And whether it's age, whatever, and and that they have no problem. For some reason, that uh, comes from, I guess, our, you know, the trauma of slavery, we feel guilty about saying, you know, this 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 needs to be a black issue. And the graphs and the numbers show why that is the case. I mean, there's no, you know, the numbers don't lie. Hmm. I have to I have to jump in here for a second because I have to give Regina credit. Um, we I call it brainwashed, and we have been brainwashed to say people of color, minorities. We've actually been brainwashed not to say black, okay? And it was Regina who was very clear, black. And then when she starts breaking it down, the same way I broke it down in the in the presentation, it's easy. If you go on Scott Stringer's website, the controller of New York City, and you look at MWBE spend, you can look at 
any different matrix for any different year. For 2019, the top five MWBEs, woman, woman, Asian, Hispanic, not one black, not one. Remember, we got $16 million in 2017 from New York City, and they spent $16 billion. So not only do we have to talk to our elected officials, which is very easy, go on their website, Senate Brian Benjamin, um, Liz Kruger, Crystal People Stokes, just go on newyorkcity.gov and look for all of the senators, write them all, but also talk to each other because we ourselves don't understand. Intuitively, if we hear MWBE, we think black. If we hear affirmative action, we think black. If we hear minority, we think black. But the fact is, every time you hear one of those terms and every time you fight for one of those terms, you raise your voice to support one of those terms, you're actually raising your voice to have black people come last, if be in the, in the, in the team at all. So we need to talk to each other as well as our elected officials. This is a whole retraining of the black mindset. And, and which, is, which is the important part of this discussion because I remember when Regina was would come on, and Regina, a lot of people kind of said, "No, we're not going to have Regina because you know where she's going to come." From. <laughs> <laughs> and Regina was being a prophet. They said, "Wait a minute, no, 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 no." I'm talking about <laughs> black people. <laughs> That's right. And, and um, but the issue is here. The important thing about this is that we're talking about. The next, I mean, you know how they talk about the gold rush and they're talking about, oh, we're talking about a situation here that is going to be gone on for if the world is still here, you know, mm -hmm. cannabis will still be here and the youth for it. Once the United States, which is going to come, once the United States legalizes cannabis and there can be research to talk about not only what we know, but what we don't know. This is going to be, I mean, the liquor thing, the number thing, and all of those things, um, it depends on what you're saying. But this plant, Dr. Rasta said, I understand it more and more, the more educated I get, was a gift from God. There's right. nothing that can can close you, can 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 feed you. Um, you can right. make brick that 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 repels insects. You can uh, that makes it hot in the day in cold. And I mean, they, and we're talking about reducing, uh, making batteries, the electric cars that that could be run by cannabis, the seed. I mean, not to mention the health, and as you were saying, the different types of um, uh, things that it can do. So we're not talking about something like alcohol or like the numbers. Some people can play the numbers. Some people don't. Some people drink. Some people don't. But when the word really gets out, the education really gets out, everybody and everything will be affected by this industry. Yeah. The, the term I always like to hear when they talk about cannabis, most importantly, hemp, is the term sustainable. And how we jump on that, and we really need to say this is a sustainable product, not only sustainable for industry, but also something sustainable for our communities. And, yeah. and just to jump on what Maria and Regina were talking about in terms of the economic uh, empowerment zones, in terms of the community focus, you know, this could be something, or this is something that will be able to sustain our communities. And therefore, we need to be at the forefront of this and make sure that the revenue that comes from this sustain our communities. And that's where we need to, you know, pretty much, you know, concentrate our resources. And that's definitely something that I think we should, you know, put out there because this is a sustainable material. And, and not only for us. I mean, we just had the, the Ghana experiment where the, a whole village is going to be used for hemp. What they're doing in Jamaica 
and all of those other types of things. Um, <laughs> you know, there there's so many different types of uh, things that make this conversation extremely, extremely important because um, uh, we can't we can't we can't sit on the back of the bus on this one. <laughs> it's going to be too important. Um, Maria, could you tell the listeners how they can reach you and also take advantage of the beautiful space that you have once we can start to come out? <laughs> and it's big enough that we can do social businesses in it because it's about three or four floors. So, you know. Well, you know, I mean, the whole house is available. It's 6,600 square feet, so um, on five different floors. And, and whatever we need to do to make it viable again, we are uh, ready, willing, and able. Could you give the website for uh, Home to Harlem? It's home, T-O, Harlem, H-O-M-E-T-O-H-A-R-L-E-M dot N-Y-C. Mm -hmm. home to harlem.nyc and i can be reached at m granville that's m g r a n as in nancy v as in victor i l l e at home to harlem.nyc and 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 richard uh could you i mean you have a number of, <laughs> of <laughs> sites, but you could give the 420 but you should also talk a little bit about what you're doing um, uh, with some of the other uh, components. Richard is a vice president of the Harlem Tourism Board also, but between uh -huh. Double Dutch, the Double Jet stuff, which is happening, the bike uh, uh, events that, that, that you do. Just yeah, I mean, I mean, Team Unity has, is, is heavily involved in several uh, initiatives in Harlem. Uh, it would actually take another program, Tony, to actually go through everything. We probably will have to do that. We yeah. can use another program. You right. know, probably but, you know what I always always want to do, how we could um, share our information, I believe that if we, let me see, maybe I can find our logo somewhere, but um, you can actually find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Cold420Events. It's Code 420 Events on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. You can get a hold of our team. Um, you can also email us at code420events at gmail.com. Mm -hmm. So it's at Code 420 Events, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Or you can email us at code420events at gmail.com. And, and Regina, could you give the Harlem Business Alliance uh, site just one more time so people can understand? And one of the things that Maria brought this, uh, even though we have these issues, if you want to apply for MWBE or any other type of of activities, uh, Harlem Business Alliance has people. Uh, once we get past all of this, that can can help you, and uh, you should definitely. Uh, look them up. Uh, Regina? So our website again is www.hbany.org and that stands for Harlem Business Alliance New York. hbany.org And um, so again, guys, uh, you know, um, you've all been friends for a very long time and uh, I am very very honored to to have you guys uh, to be in your orbit, you know. But uh, the fight, uh, this is really important. I, I can't think of, of all of the things that I've talked about, even though uh, the the health and well being of of cannabis was something that allowed for me to realize from some personal issues to looking at. Uh, friends and, and the relationship dealing with my wellness uh, business that there was something that we needed to be educated about because so many people were miseducated as to what that is. But uh, after that is understood, uh, we need to understand how we, uh, again, sustainable uh, income, 
this is going to be something that not only we can save the black communities, but communities in general, because I mean, this is just a, a, an incredible, incredible um, uh, industry that's going to not stop. And uh, thank you all for being advocates for it. And restorative justice, we just have to say that again. Restorative, restorative justice. justice is where we need to be looking at as relates to not only New York State, but any state that's beginning to do that, or exactly. or it's the country. Because we know when the country legalizes, we gotta make sure, you know, that that is in that too, which I know that that may be a stretch, but we need to make sure that at least our state, all, all politics is local. So we need to make sure that we can and take advantage of it. So thank you all for um, being part of this. Uh, for me, uh, as it relates to the future, this may be one of the most important discussions that I've had because this is something that if done right, our children, our children's children may be able mm -hmm. to be um, well off and, 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 and secure themselves because that's what this industry is going to do. So thanks again, appreciate you all. And I hope as many people can see what we're talking about as possible and contact you so that we can speak with one voice. Take care and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey. Right. Thank Take you everybody. Care. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Regina. Thank you. Thank you.